Welcome to Thoughtfully Mindless. My guest in this episode is Duncan Baskaran Brown. Duncan is a speaker, author, Morris dancer, and alcohol awareness expert. In the past, he's had his fair share of overindulgence, drinking more than his fair share of wine, and eating more kebabs than he cares to remember. After 20 years of overdoing it, he cleaned up his act and trained with the world's most successful stop smoking service. But that wasn't enough. He studied at Cornell University, the Chartered Management Institute, and in a windowless room in Peterborough. His most recent book is Real Men Quit, which he describes as the armchair macho guide to beating booze and finding the life you want. He's interviewed scores of sober superstars, and he gets out of bed each morning because he wants to end the harm done by alcohol. He lives near Oxford with his one wife, one daughter, and two bonsai trees. On top of Morris dancing, he enjoys falling off his inline skates. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And with that, let's welcome Duncan. Duncan, thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure. I'm looking forward to having a bit of a chat. Yeah, definitely. To get started, I figure we can just walk through your journey a little bit. You used to be a drinker, and then eventually you stopped. So why don't you walk us through that just a little yeah, so, I mean, I, I, like a lot of people, I started drinking when I was um, when I was in my teens, and it seemed to be something that was very social. It seemed to be something that would help me with socialising, you know. I was a little bit, a little bit anxious, lacking in confidence, um, you know, the typical kind of teenage stuff. And I, I thought, wow, this is amazing. It's like all my Christmases had come at once kind of thing. And it seemed to, seemed to give me the confidence seemed to, you know, help me be funny, help me be creative. It seemed like it was offering everything. And then, you know, time went on and I got a bit older and things, things changed. And I think the most obvious thing that changed was I started drinking more, but I started drinking with less people. And I think as that change went on and I ended up, you know, drinking a couple of bottles of wine on my own every evening in my flat, it, it, it's like the, the, the benefits that it seemed to give me just, you know, it, it became, became obvious that they were a bit of an illusion and actually the problems that it was giving me were, were real and they became harder and harder to ignore. So, uh, yeah, I got to a point where I thought, it's probably time to do something. Yeah. So when you got started drinking when you were younger, was it parties or for me, it was parties. Actually, I think the first time I drank, it was, I was having a phone conversation with a girl that I was dating. It was like, I was so young that we weren't dating really. It was just calling each other. I remember they would talk to me about, uh, the girl would talk to me about what she was drinking and I tried some, I think it was brandy for the first time. Your first time drinking, what was that like? What was that about? Yeah, so I, I don't really want to blame girls as such because it obviously wasn't their fault, but I think that had a little bit to do with my experience as well. I, I mean, interestingly, I think if you... if when you ask people when, what was your first experience with alcohol, they will tend to give you some sort of teenage moment where they first got drunk. But of course, that wasn't actually my first experience with alcohol. My parents uh, believed that if they introduced me to alcohol young and, uh, you know, gave me a little bit and taught me to drink responsibly, I would somehow turn into a responsible drinker. That didn't quite work out. But um, yes, I mean, the first time I seriously drank, you know, with my my friends rather than, you know, a little glass of uh, sweet sherry with dinner kind of thing. Yeah, it was it was um, it was at a party social event started off very boisterous, very social, uh, ended up kind of a bit more about vomit than uh, being social. But, you know, I felt awful the next morning. And for some reason, that didn't put me off. Yeah, to go back, I actually have a similar experience. My parents were, they'd have a little wine that we can drink during like Thanksgiving and different holidays. And I don't know, what do you think? Did that help at all? Or was that bad on your end? Because like for me, I, I think it was probably good in a certain sense. Like, hey, this isn't, yeah, I don't know. 
Go ahead and yeah. I, I mean, did it did it help? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I, I, I'll answer that in a slightly different way. So I I will do everything I can to endeavour to make sure that my daughter doesn't drink alcohol until she is at least twenty five. I mean, admittedly, I am going to fail, but that is kind of what I'm what what I would aim to do because the science is fairly clear that putting psychoactive chemicals, be they alcohol, marijuana, nicotine, even caffeine, arguably even sugar, into the minds of developing uh, young people is is a terrible idea. And there is something about alcohol in terms of exposure. So the more you drink, the more likely you are to develop a problem with it. But it isn't purely a dose-response relationship. It, it can be very much affected by the age of the person drinking. So if you drink heavily when you are younger, you are much more likely to develop a problem. And that's, that's not my opinion. That you know that, that is genuinely the science. I mean, I don't hold it against my parents. That was the folk wisdom at the time, wasn't it? That you know, if you teach young people to drink in a responsible environment, they will then go on and be responsible drinkers. Unfortunately, the, the opposite is often the case. The more exposure they have, at a young age, the more likely they are to have a problem. Yeah, it, it does seem like that's the case. You, you said you started drinking without people around you, and I, I have a similar experience. I was traveling, and over time, it was just more, I'm on the road, I, I'm bored, and I start drinking. At what point did you start to feel like it was a problem? Like, did you quit as soon as you realized it was a problem, or did you have a period of knowing it's a problem and slowly coming to terms with what you actually needed to do yeah i mean that that is a that is a very very good question i i mean i think from around my late teens early 20s that was when i started to drink on my own not massively but i never really particularly had any concern about having to have other people uh, around I mean, still at that age, you know, I was very sociable. So most of the drinking I did was with other people. Uh, as it progressed, you know, less people, more alcohol. And I think that there's this kind of thing in the community. A lot of people like to frame their story around some sort of like 4 a.m. moment where, you know, they were staring into the mirror and they suddenly realized that it was, you know, terrible and that they had to do something about it. And the only realization I've ever had at 4 a.m. staring into the mirror is that staring into the mirror at 4 a.m. does nothing to change your life. And I, I think you, you're absolutely right that it, it was a very gradual process and you can't sort of like pinpoint, much as we'd like to, because it makes a good story, you can't kind of pinpoint and go, that was the moment. It was this kind of gradual reduction of the enjoyment that I got from it and the escalation of the problem. But I think what's really interesting about it was the problems were stacking up, but I was, you know, I'm, in a, I'm, I'm like most drinkers. I'm a creative and intelligent guy. I just used my creativity and intelligence for utterly the wrong thing, which was justifying my drinking and making it seem like it wasn't a problem and that, you know, I was all right. And then I went and sought out friends who drank more than me so I could stand next to them and go, well, yeah, I'm not as bad as, uh, we'll call him Dave. I mean, it, that really is his name, but there are a lot of Dave, so you won't know who I'm talking about. Um, you know, I'd stand next to Dave and go, well, it's, I'm not as bad as Dave, so it can't be a problem. And I'd come up with all of these kind of like great ways of soothing the mental anguish that alcohol was causing me. And, you know, if they failed, I'd, I'd just have another drink, wouldn't I? So, yeah, I think it was this kind of slow process by which it got to a tipping point whereby I could no longer sort of really justify it. You know, it, it was, it was, it was too big. What age were you when you stopped drinking? Um, I was eight and a half years younger than I am now, which would have made me 38 um, and a bit probably. Yeah. 38 and a bit. I, I mean, what really sparked it for me was my wife and I, we were, we were trying to have that daughter that um, I'm never going to let drink. And we, we were trying to conceive for, for a fair period of time and she had a miscarriage and that was really hard. I mean, it, it, that's always hard. That's a, a very difficult thing um, for a woman and it, it's a very difficult thing to try and support somebody through. 
And I totally lacked the skills to to be there for her. And, I, you know, I, I only had one response to emotional, physical, or mental pain, and that was just to drink. So I just drank a lot more rather than talking about it, as we, we probably should have done. Um, and, of course, that made things just a whole lot worse. And it sort of got to a head. It kind of got to a point. It was never explicitly stated in such obvious terms, but I, I basically spent a few months on this pendulum of trying to decide whether I wanted to have a child or whether I wanted to have another drink. Interesting. I, I think you touched on something really important. When you're drinking, it's a, I don't know what, you can call it whatever you want, a crutch, anything you want, but it's a coping mechanism at the very least. Like it's a way to cope with things, but you're, you're not dealing with those things. So when you're going through a miscarriage or you're going through, uh, at what point in my life I was going through a breakup and I, I remember I drank a lot afterward and I basically never processed anything and I eventually stop drinking and man it uh it really takes you out of those relationships and takes you out of those situations where you're where you're not dealing with it when you're drinking yeah i i mean i think you you hit on quite a good point i, I mean people people would call alcohol a coping mechanism um but it is it's a maladapt uh, maladaptive coping mechanism to to give it a kind of fancy schmancy title isn't it but what because because what it does is it doesn't actually help you to cope it simply removes the problem for a little bit and it, it doesn't even kind of remove the problem very effectively what what i would find was you know i'd be like i'm i'm stressed i've had a hard day i've got all of these problems that i need to deal with i'm going to have a glass of wine and then, you know the first one would definitely make me less aware of those problems and they would seem like they were they were going away but by the time I got towards the end of the second bowl they'd all be coming back and they'd be coming back with a, a, a lot more force and I'd you know be obviously in a position not to be able to deal with them at all so they'd just be playing on my mind so they'd just be getting bigger and bigger and bigger but it then becomes this kind of cycle. You know, there's pain in your life. You believe that drinking alcohol is going to remove the pain, but actually it just causes more pain. And what's your response to pain? It is, of course, to drink more. So you would just end up with pain behavior, more pain, more behavior, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it spirals out of control. And, you know, some people live that for, for years. Some people think it's life. Yeah, and it's interesting because... I fell into this myself, but a lot of people, you see with cigarette smokers a lot, um, where they, they'll be smoking a cigarette and they'll talk about how bad it is for them. Like they'll be very aware of what they're doing and that they don't want to do it. I've, I've had many, and I used to smoke cigarettes too, but I've had people who are smoking cigarettes warning me never to smoke cigarettes. And same thing with alcohol. I've had a few scenarios where people who are drinking tell you not to drink. And it's like, well, why are you drinking? So why do you think it is that we do that? Like where we're, we know something is not good for us. And alcohol is a little bit different because it's definitely not good for us, but we, we have this society built around it, which we can also talk about because that's a very big thing to deal with when you stop drinking. But what do you think that is that we do things like alcohol, smoking cigarettes, anything else, knowing that it's bad, but not, I, obviously it's addiction, but why can't we face up to what we need? It kind of points to something that's amazing about the human mind. We're actually quite good at holding two opposing views at the same time. And you know, this is one of the things that a lot of people, when they when when they get sober and they start to really kind of understand a bit more about how their mind works, they start to uncover a lot of different tensions that we we hold in our mind. But I, I mean, most drinkers, most smokers, most people that do any kind of drugs, they love it and they hate it, and they try and hold those two opposing views in their mind. And of course, you know, to an extent, your mind will compensate, your mind will do some clever things. But at the end of the day, it causes a certain amount of pain. The fancy word for that pain is, of course, cognitive dissonance. Yeah, many of your listeners may well be aware of the um, 
works of a certain psychologist called Festinger who coined the term cognitive dissonance. But it's just having these two opposing ideas and the discomfort that it causes in your mind. And that is, in many respects, that is one of the worst things about drinking or smoking, is that you kind of have to live with this tension. And it it is... You know, it is amazing how how much your mind can kind of soothe these things over and invent stories to kind of minimise them and and distract them and stand next to Dave and go, yeah, yeah, but I'm not as bad as Dave. But however good it is, you know, there will always be this dissonance. There will always be this discomfort, and that that I think is the bit that people don't talk about. I mean, admittedly, people often don't talk about the ill health effects of alcohol, but they definitely never talk about the, the the mental drain that it causes. And the same with cigarettes. You know, you look at the health warnings on the packets, they're all about physical health. And they never go on about how it will steal your self-confidence, make you anxious, uh, you know, make you feel like a slave. It will create this discomfort in your head. Never talk about that sort of stuff, which is which is a bit of a shame, which is why I talk about it all the time. Uh, were you a smoker too, or just a drinker? Oh, God, yeah. Two bottles of wine, two packs a day, and eating fried chicken like it was some sort of snack. You know, somebody the other day uh, asked me uh, what my drug of choice was, and I think the only fair response was, what have you got? <laughs> Can you uh, dive into, you eventually decided that something needed to change. It didn't change right away. Can you Talk a little bit about the, I would imagine, mental struggles. Like I know I dealt with that Like when I knew I wanted to quit, but I hadn't really quit. I started paying attention to my triggers a lot more. I, I started to try to be mindful, and it, it wasn't an overnight process that I ultimately quit. It was very a conscious, prolonged path of me paying attention, and eventually I just stopped. Yeah, well, I, I, I think you've, you've hit on something very important there as well. That you, you know, whatever it is, whether it's, whether it's drinking, smoking, or any kind of behavior, um, really the first step is awareness and becoming aware of what you are doing and when you are doing it. It's, it is so important because the vast majority of alcohol that we drink, we, we aren't really aware that we're doing it. You know, we do it simply because we are in a situation where we always drink alcohol. And, you know, taken to its logical conclusion, you're, you're, you're putting vodka on your cornflakes and, uh, you know, you're drinking the whole time. Most people don't quite get there. Most people think they're all right because they don't drink before seven o'clock, maybe six, five on the weekend at max. But, you know, generally I don't drink during the day, so I'm all right. But we then associate everything in life with alcohol, don't we? It's like, well, I'm watching the football. I have to have a beer. I'm going out with my friends. I have to have a beer. I'm having dinner. I have to have a glass of wine. Oh, you know, Netflix isn't quite the same without a a glass of whiskey. And and, well, yeah, I mean, there is a lot of drinking on Netflix. So uh, I see where you're coming from with that one. But, But you end up just associating everything with drinking. And part of the process, I think, is understanding that. I mean, what I tend to do with people is we tend to try and get right down to their beliefs. So why is it you believe that 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 you will enjoy football more as when you're drinking? Why is it you believe you will enjoy a meal more when you're drinking? Why do you believe going out with your friends is going to be more enjoyable? And bizarrely, I so I you might have heard I'm I'm not actually from America. I am from uh, the UK. I live near Oxford, uh, but I do love American football. So the Super Bowl for me is always a kind of middle of the night thing, and um, I always used to think, well, it's the Super Bowl. I've got to have a good old drink with the Super Bowl, and I'd be asleep by halftime. So like. How on earth do I think that that is helping me enjoy the game when I don't even see the end of it because I've fallen asleep? But I did, you know, that's that kind of that creativity, that intelligence that drinkers can apply to their drinking. Despite all evidence to the contrary, I would say, you know, I'd have to have a drink if I was watching some football. Would you say that when you started to focus on it and slowly start changing and and distancing yourself from alcohol was was it a belief thing that you were focusing on like what what did you personally do 
Yeah, yeah. So um, I stopped smoking using uh, Alan Carr's Easy Way. Um, and I'm a massive fan of the Easy Way clinics. That's where I trained as a therapist. And um, so for me, it was a kind of, it was a very obvious piece. I, I As soon as I had any contact with, with um, the Easy Way, it, it became obvious to me what the power of it was. And it gets underneath the surface and it, it really gets to grips with people's beliefs. And once you've um, dealt with the, the, the beliefs, it gives you this very sort of simple thought management piece, which is a, a way of approaching triggers, if you like. It's a way of kind of re, repackaging the thoughts. And then if you've dealt with the beliefs and you've dealt with the thoughts, then the behavior is the easy bit. The problem is that most people do it the other way around. They they change the behavior and they hope the thoughts and the beliefs are going to catch up. And unfortunately, they rarely do. So yeah, absolutely. For me, it is always, always start with the beliefs, always question why do you believe that? Because most of the time, it's just because you've you know, you've just been exposed to that the whole of your life. That's why you believe it, not because there's any truth to it. In fact, usually with about 30 seconds thought, you can come up with quite a lot of evidence to the contrary. I actually have read Alan Carr's Stop Drinking Easy Way. I, I can't remember if that's the exact title, but uh, I believe one of the things in there is he doesn't tell you to start reading once you've stopped. He has you start reading it while you're potentially still drinking were you still drinking and smoking while you were reading it yeah yeah yes um that 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 i think is such an effective way of approaching things because if you um it's kind of it's very similar to the therapeutic approach which a lot of people take whereby they don't necessarily set out to stop drinking but they engage in a therapeutic process often cognitive often going and seeing a therapist the kind of talking stuff the psychodynamic stuff that we'd usually associate with therapy but it can also be done in a kind of more physical way so i've met quite a few people who've stopped um, drinking as a result of getting very into something like yoga or massage, which is very embodied. And they've sort of done the work and then they've just discovered that they no longer need to drink. The thing that they thought alcohol was providing with th- them with has no longer become necessary. And I think that that is the key to, to stopping successfully is to get to the point whereby you no longer want to drink and then stop drinking. That said, I do have to uh, add a slight caveat to that. There are some people that really need to stop drinking uh, slightly quicker than that. They don't necessarily have the luxury. And I've certainly worked with people who, uh, you know, they can't do the work because the alcohol is affecting their thinking so much. So some people do need to stop first and then do the work. But I think if you are drinking at a dangerous level, but not, you know, two bottles of spirits uh, a, a day, you you have the the potential to actually, you know, do the work and then the drink. Then you'll get to a point where actually stopping drinking is just, it's just brilliant. It's just amazing. It's just like what you want to do because because it no longer fulfills any even imaginary function in your life. Yeah, I, for me, I stopped drinking. I had already made the decision to stop drinking, and I, I believe I saw comedian Nikki Glasser. I might be saying her name wrong, but she mentioned the Alan Carr book, and I read it after I had already stopped drinking. And I don't know how you feel about it, for, but for me, I felt like it was... I don't want to... I'm going to use the word, but it's not an accurate summary. But I thought it was kind of stupid and repetitive, but... I accepted it for what it was. I was like, I I felt like what it was doing was essentially kind of brainwashing me into believing that alcohol is bad and just a poison, which it is. And uh, I just kind of gave into that. I'm I'm like, I'm just going to read it and just go full into it, even knowing that I think it's kind of cheesy as a probably a better word than stupid, but it it seems kind of cheesy and it's like you it's very repetitive and it's just kind of beating something into your head. But at the end it is like, yeah, my mindset had changed a bit after that. It, 
do you feel kind of similarly or yeah yeah so th- there is an irony of course in uh everything that alan ever wrote because you know he talks a lot about brainwashing now personally I don't really like the phrase brainwashing. I think it's a bit like 1950s MK Ultra kind of, you know, like it's a, it's a bit Maoist communist from for my liking. And it's certainly not a term that psychologists use these days. But yeah, he talked an awful lot about brainwashing. Um, and it, whilst he did it, he, he tried to brainwash you. Um, but yeah, it's 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 using the same sort of techniques, you know, but using them for good, reinforcing something something in your mind and you know when you when you get down to it 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 is very hard to scientifically validate our beliefs you know it is very difficult to scientifically validate the story we tell ourselves and if it helps you to think differently about a problem that you have if it if it gives you a different narrative if it changes the story you have around alcohol then you know, that is a, a very effective thing. I mean, honestly, it's not for everyone. You know, cognitive realignment, which is what Alan does, which is what Annie Grace, who's pretty famous as well, it's what she does. It's what quite a lot of um, sober coaches these days do. Cognitive realignment, you know, it's very effective um, for the right kind of people. But you, you've got to sort of be a bit more nuanced with it and you've got to to meet people where they are and understand who they are and how they think and what they need rather than just trying to uh, funnel them all into one single approach yeah do you do you try to help people set goals that drinking prevents them from doing i know with myself one of the goals that i had was to read a book a week and I was mostly drinking on the weekend, although on the weeknights I still would. It would just be lower amounts. But for me, one of the big motivating things was also having like issues in my relationship because of alcohol. But all, uh, that goal of wanting to read, it's really hard to read when you're hungover, <laughs> like very hard. Um, it's one of the last things that you want to do, actually. I found that out myself, but I'd imagine some people don't always know what they'd like to refocus on. Um, Do you help people set goals and things like that? Yeah, I I mean, there's so much uh, in in what (laughs) in what you said. Um, So I read a lot more than I used to when uh, when I was drinking, and I I love reading. I mean, I love books, always have. Uh, You know, love them so much. I've written a few, and. that that is one of the things that that absolutely you know eight and a half years on i can i can honestly count on the number of fingers on probably one maybe two hands the amount of nights that i haven't gone to bed and read you know i was it might only be a page if i'm tired i might only get a page but every night i read a little bit um of some sci-fi uh before i go to bed and that is like one of the pure pleasures of sobriety it never could have done that so uh, when i was drinking honestly i didn't really go to bed as such when i was drinking i would usually fall fall asleep where i was drinking wake up in the middle of the night and crawl towards the bed sort of thing so massive massive difference but to actually return to the question you were asking so there's this thing in sobriety that that generally people don't talk about and that is that uh, when you stop drinking you stop poisoning yourself you get an immediate boost you do feel better you have more energy you have better focus you 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 know you enjoy things more because you are no longer putting poison into your body so you get this kind of like initial surge of boom uh you know life is better but what happens, and it can happen relatively quickly, is that life starts to catch up with you. Invariably, there was something you were trying to ignore whilst you were drinking, whether that's emotional, spiritual, physical, or just, you know, you hate your job. Whatever it is, when you're sober, you end up having to kind of face it. And what typically happens to people is this period from about three months to about 15 months, there will be a dip at some point. Some people it's bigger, some people it's other. Some people don't even really notice it. 
but there is always a little dip in satisfaction. And if you can get back up, if you can get to the other side and get typically to around the two year mark, what you will find is then the statistics are pretty clear. After two years, it is an upwards curve. You know, it, it keeps going up. And literally, you can talk to people who've done 40 years sober time and they will say, well, actually, this year is still a little bit better than last year. I mean, it's not as bigger, it's not as steeper an increase, but it, it keeps getting better after two years. And because nobody really talks about that, there are a lot of um, systems that are designed simply to get you stop drinking. And that's great because stopping drinking will improve your life, but it will not build a life. And thus, I always try to work with people in a kind of long-term way. I, 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 very specific with them at the start. It's like, if you just want to stop drinking, we can do that. But my advice is that we we keep working at least so that we can get over that three to uh, 15 month period. And once you get through that, you know, once you've you've really stabilized and everything is is starting to to like really blossom, that's when you get into the success bit. And that is when you get into the the realms of setting goals like you wouldn't even imagine. You know, uh, I've seen so many people really embrace success uh, since getting sober. My good friend Nick is currently rowing the Atlantic. Uh, that's what getting sober has done for him. Now, <laughs> you may be thinking, what an idiot. Why would I do that? But it's not just that. I mean, I've, I can give you examples of people who've achieved massive sporting success, who've, um, you know, built businesses, who've created great art. You know, there, there's so many um, amazing possibilities that sobriety offers you. So um, that is a roundabout way of saying, yeah, I really love getting into people's goals. I think we have addictive personalities. People tend to have addictive personalities in general. And one of the ways I kind of looked at it is you need some other addictions to fill that addiction that you're walking away from. And uh, addiction itself isn't necessary. I mean, it, it can be a bad thing no matter what you're addicted to because you want to be well-rounded and, and have things in control in different parts of your life. But it's okay to be addicted to things that are good to at least some degree where you're, you know, you have extra motivation. You just, you can't walk away from a book. You can't walk away from your business. You want to just put everything into it. Um, would you agree with that? Like, I, I think we kind of replace one addiction with another and it's just partially about choosing the right addictions. Yeah, I mean, there is an awful lot in, in what you say. Just in terms of personality, um, if you look at the kind of the 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 better regarded personality systems that psychologists actually like, what they tend to talk about these days is traits rather than types. So it's not like you have a particular personality type that is correlated with addiction. And in actual fact, if you look at um Ocean, which is is one of the the better regarded trait models. There's um, extroversion and introversion. There's openness to new experiences, and there's not being open to new experiences. And I, for everybody who is very open to addiction, uh, uh, open to addiction. <laughs> open to new experiences that gets addicted to something, I can find you somebody who's actually quite close. And they do it for different reasons. So uh, extroverts will tend to drink because they're at parties a lot. And introverts will tend to drink because they have social anxiety. You know, it's two absolutely different uh, personality traits that result in the same thing. So I definitely don't think there is a personality type that, that gets addicted. Uh, there is clearly an, an issue that a lot of people have. They have some sort of underlying problem, which often is connected to, ch to trauma. Often it's connected to childhood trauma. Not always, but often. And until they find a way to work through and process that trauma, um, they will just keep moving to different addictions, which is technically known as cross addiction. So I did that myself. You know, I stopped smoking and uh, I stopped taking drugs and everybody went, that's brilliant. Um, and I went, not really. I've just started drinking more. 
Um, and then I stopped drinking and everybody went, that's really great. Um, and it was until I started eating the way I used to drink. And, to, you know, I, I, I literally got to a point where I was just staring at this packet of um, triple chocolate chip cookies, you know, realizing that I was doing exactly the same thing because I had problems that I hadn't dealt with, that I hadn't coped with. So I was just trying to mask them and I just changed it to a different substance. And sadly, that is incredibly common. Uh, many people who have an alcohol problem that they successfully uh, get rid of then go on to develop some sort of eating problem. And in actual fact, the statistics are pretty grim in the other direction too. If you look at people who have gastric band surgery, for example, a worryingly large amount of them start drinking heavily because they can no longer use food the way they were using food. So the trick is not so much to get rid of the behavior, it's to get rid of the underlying problem that was causing the behavior. In terms of are there positive addictions, that, that I think is a really interesting subject. You know, I mean, I'm going to make a guess about you that you're probably a little bit all or nothing. I mean, in general, people, if if they're a bit all, you know, if they're a bit kind of like, mm, can't be bothered, they they listen to podcasts. If they're a bit all or nothing, they tend to start them. <laughs> so uh, that's, you know, that's, that, that's probably a little bit who you are. And it's certainly, I am absolutely like that. If I do something, I get obsessed with it. But not everybody in the community is like that. So I kind of like want to get across that 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 is not something inherently that is going to make you uh, make you become addicted to stuff. But, there, but then again, there is this massive kind of discrepancy in our thinking as a society. You look at some very, very broken people who've gone on to create, uh, you know, great works of literature great businesses, um, great music, and we laud them because they have taken the pain that they had from their childhood and they've tried to ignore it by working really, really hard. And we claim that is a good thing. If, however, they'd taken that pain and stuck it in a bottle or stuck it in a needle, we would have said it was a terrible thing. Yeah. And with the, uh, like great writers and stuff there, there have been great writers who have been alcoholics. Um, I think Ernest Hemingway was an alcoholic, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ernest Hemingway once said you should write drunk and edit sober. And, you know, I, F. Scott Fitzgerald is another fantastic example. Yeah, I mean, some of his writing is pretty good. I will give you that. Some of his writing is actually a bit pedestrian, and I think he probably could have done better because he often stole off himself. He was a bit he was a bit lazy as a writer. He would often stick passages in from different books, thinly disguised. But one thing is for absolute sure, F. Scott Fitzgerald was a horrible person. And he was not the kind of person you'd want to be around. And actually, I think that comes across in his writing. I think, you know, his real discomfort bordering on hatred of women is quite evident in in his work so yeah the guy can turn a phrase but um is he an example to follow i'm i'm not so sure yeah well, there is um some evidence that a drink could spark creativity that could increase creativity but honestly uh, it's one of the things i struggle with because when i look back i actually produced more music when i was drinking but the ability to <laughs> stop at that one drink or two drinks is just not there. I don't know how you are, but when I was drinking, it was everything was going to get drunk by the, the time I was done drinking. And I would have, I don't think everyone has an issue with drinking. I, I know a lot of people who drink and, and handle it responsibly, but I know when I, I would always be the one who wanted to keep drinking. Even if it wasn't with everyone else, it was like, I just, I just want another beer to wind down for the night. And, uh, were you the same at all? Like, were you just kind of wanted to keep drinking? So I was the same in two ways and I'm going to begin this. I'm going to continue this thing of like answering at least six of the questions you asked, but certainly in terms of creativity, uh, yeah, I absolutely believed that that drinking sparked my creativity. And you're right, it might have done a little bit the first few drinks. But 
you know, I wrote for 20 years when I was drinking and I never really did anything with it. I've been sober for eight and a half years and my third book's coming out uh, at the end of this month. So I don't know, just in terms of focus and energy, because I have so much more, I am able to create more stuff. You know, it's like, and I think that's probably the misunderstanding that people have. They think creativity is this kind of mysterious stuff that comes from the muse, but it's not. It's actually sitting down and getting on with it. And alcohol always got in the way of that for me. And to answer the question about could I drink one? No, I don't. I think there had there have been times in my life where I drank and stopped, but there wasn't that many of them. Far more often would be the kind of like I'd unscrew the lid of the brandy bottle and I'd throw it away and say, we're not going to need that again. And yeah, it was absolutely, you know, um, uh, there's that, that great AA phrase, um, one is too many because a thousand is never enough. Did you ever, so you've been sober for eight and a half years. Did you have a period where you tried drinking again ever? Um, so in the last eight and a half years, I have had the odd uh, dessert that I suddenly realized had alcohol in it. So I have been exposed to alcohol in the last eight and a half years. And I'm pleased to say it didn't send me on a five day bender that ended in the county jail. Um, but no, I have no desire to try moderate drinking. Um, I, it's, it's a question that I wrestled with a lot probably about 18 months ago. I thought long and hard about it. It's like, at what point in my life would I be safe to to start drinking again should I want to start drinking again? Not that I did. I just, it was a very theoretical question that I spend my afternoons doing stuff like that is probably a bit of a reflection. Anyway, the conclusion that I came to is that I would be perfectly able to drink again once I'd reached the point in my life when I no longer wanted to drink. I stopped drinking in 2020. So 2020 was my first year sober. And I got into August of last year of 2022. And I decided I'm going to try to have a couple drinks. And and I did fine. And then we went to our friend's wedding in Greece and I overindulged. And my last time drinking, I was extremely hungover and in an Uber. And I was sitting with my girlfriend. I'm like, I'm I'm never drinking again. That's that's it, you know. And I say that, but I can see myself trying a sip of different beers that I used to like, you know, not that I used to like, but if I were in a foreign country around different beers, but it would be within those small parameters, it wouldn't be drinking. It would be just tasting things. What would your advice, like I learned from experience that going back and, and trying to do it moderately and, and all of that, it just, it doesn't work for me. How would you handle somebody who's considering that keeping them from making that mistake potentially and and keeping on track with what they're doing because i i know after i drank i i had regrets i mean that was two and a half years without alcohol and now i can say i stopped drinking in 2020 but i can't say i've been without alcohol for three years or four years or whatever. Yeah, it it's been. all right, man. I'm not the sober police. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to make you change your sober day. It's cool. Don't worry. But what, what I would say to somebody who was trying to, who was contemplating moderation after a long period of not drinking, um, look, you know, I, I cannot give you that the answer to that question. It is only you that can answer that question. What I try and provide for people who have questions like that is an environment whereby they can actually think it through for themselves. Um, that is, you know, giving them this very rare gift of listening. Now, your, your listeners will be quite amazed that I am actually quite 
good at listening because uh, I I do talk quite a lot. I am aware of this fact. But um, I think giving people an opportunity to think something through by by really truly listening to try and understand what they're saying and then asking occasional questions to help them clarify their thinking that is the only really way only real way to to make a decision i mean i can shortcut cut it for you and you know just say well if your friend said to you i haven't drunk for 3 years i've been very happy without drinking i'm thinking of having a drink what would you say because i would suspect most people would say don't do it dude you know and it is one of those things that's very difficult because there are people who appear to drink in a moderate way. There are people who actually do drink in a moderate way, um, but they are actually quite rare. And I think society has it almost the wrong way round. We sort of think that the vast majority of people drink happily and healthily and have a good old time, but there is this tiny minority of people who are spoiling it for the rest of us. And I think that is almost exactly the wrong way around. There is a very small amount of people who actually drink in a safe, uh, healthy, respectful kind of a way. And the vast majority of people, it is doing them some sort of damage. Now, true, they're not flat out uh, vodka on the cornflakes drinking. They're not doing as much damage as somebody who's lost their job, lost their house, lost their family, lost their driving license. But even drinking two or three times a week is going to be causing you some form of damage. That might be a risk that you're perfectly ex- happy to take, but even that level of moderate drinking is risky. And if you've ever got into any difficulties with drinking in the past, trying to sustain that level of moderate drinking I, I think is really very difficult and it's far more trouble than it is worth. There are people out there who will tell you that you can successfully go back to moderate drinking and good on them if they've managed it. But I always get a little bit cynical when people say things like that. I think they're pro- they're perhaps just telling you what you want to hear. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. I think uh, a lot of people, I think one of the reasons we have this impression that so many people drink without problems is we tend to see them drinking before we see the problems. Like usually the problematic behavior I'm thinking of drunk dialing people. And I can't even count how many stupid things I did while I was drinking. And I'm, I'm happy. I still use like marijuana occasionally, but I don't do incredibly stupid things, uh, on marijuana And I use it for pain mostly. But with drinking, I think a lot of people have problems later on in the night. And we tend not to see that when we're, you know, if you're at a party or something like that, or you're at a social gathering at a bar or something, we tend not to see that behavior that starts to come out later after 10, 11, 12 drinks. And uh, I I do think it's it's something that, our society kind of lies to us about. I, I I think that's a that's a very interesting point in terms of sort of the short term that you often see the the good bits and then the bad bits are hidden. But I will the the one thing I think most people don't really appreciate about alcohol is that everybody who drinks drinks more over time. So you know when we're kids. Uh, well, when we're really little kids, even irresponsible parents wouldn't give a four-year-old alcohol, would they? You know, so even really little kids, they they don't drink at all. So we're always starting from this point of not drinking. So any drinking you do is always an increase, isn't it? But what happens? You know, you start drinking with your mates in the when you're a teenager, and you know you don't drink that much, but you get a little bit more freedom in your twenties. You get a little bit more money, so you drink a little bit more. Uh, there might be a bit of a dip when you have kids, but you know once they've they've learn to roughly take care of themselves, it tends to go back up. As you hit your 40s, 50s, you know, you get the pay rises, uh, you you got more money, you got a bit more time, you tend to start drinking even more. Uh, Once you hit retirement, you tend to start drinking even more, not necessarily because you are drinking more 
on the average week, but because you are retired, there are less and less average weeks and you're just on holiday a lot more. So, you know, you think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm on a cruise ship. Of course I will have a cocktail before dinner and a couple of glasses of wine with, with dinner. That's nothing special. But, you know, you then end up doing that six weeks a year and that really does rack up. So the, the, the graph is pretty clear. You know, in general, people will drink more throughout their lives. Now, there is no hard and fast number of units or litres of pure ethanol where you can absolutely say, well, if you're drinking that much, you have a problem. But roughly speaking, I would say 50 units, which is about five bottles of wine a week. 50 units, that is problem territory. You're drinking anywhere near that or definitely more than that, you've got an issue. And the only reason why the vast majority of people don't get to 50 units is simply that they don't live long enough. If they actually lived to 120 and continued the graph that they were on, they would all end up drinking 50 units a, a, a week. It, the, 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 the direction is is fixed, you know? They're going up, they're drinking more and more throughout their life. The only reason why it doesn't become a problem is because they die first. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I think, at least from my own perspective, from my own experience, I definitely experienced that where my alcohol consumption increased over time. And when I was younger, the hangovers weren't that bad. You know, you're you're younger, you you can recover quickly. You still have hangovers and everything like that, but it, it's just not that bad. Toward the end of drinking, for me, I was, I felt it in my body. Like I would drink, and I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm, I feel like I have poison in my body right now, and uh, it it really is something that just increases over time. You mentioned earlier that some people need to quit a lot more suddenly. Um, how do you? help somebody who's in that situation. I, I've known people in that situation. And one thing I would point out with that is there's a aspect of alcohol that people feel, or they probably really are more charismatic when they're on alcohol because you're more social and stuff like that. But when you have that, that's that fades away over time. And eventually you're just the drunk. You're just the person who drinks too much. And and a lot, I've seen people who are that charismatic drinker become kind of an obnoxious alcoholic where they're just, no one really likes to be around them. How do you convince somebody to walk away from alcohol or stop when they're at that point? Oh, yeah, I know exactly what you mean about the drifting into obnoxiousness thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have to constantly tread this line between overconfidence and obnoxious, and I hope, <laughs> hope I'm getting it right today. I uh, certainly never did when I was a drinker. We're just like, uh, so talking about those personality things, you know, one of them's agreeable and disagreeable. And I'm definitely way more over to the disagreeable side. Uh, and these days, I try to constructively challenge people, you know, I like try to point out to them that I am, I will accept you absolutely for who you are. I think your experiences and your views are very, very valid. Um, you know, I love you as a human being. It's just your ideas and your beliefs that I'm trying to get. At. Um, so that, <laughs> that that is always a tension that, that that I had. But how do you actually help people that want to be helped uh, that maybe haven't quite got to the point that they want to be helped? And this is this is something that comes up ag again and again because there is a belief that you have to want to change, and I think there is a lot in that. You know, if you do want to change, it does make life somewhat easier. But my personal experience with it is that I, I've met a lot of and I'll be honest with you, they're blokes. They are usually guys. I've met a lot of guys and they're usually uh, coming to see me because their wife is making them. And what they've decided is that they'll just chat to this idiot for a little bit because it will shut their wife up and then they can have a nice drink afterwards. And what they do is they realise that we're actually quite similar that, you know, we're exactly the same. And, you know, it's like genuinely, however bad you think you are, um, 
I can guarantee you I've heard worse uh, and probably did worse. So, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to upset me or worry me or offend me with your behavior. Like I, I genuinely, I have been there. I have done that. I've got the t-shirt. I just don't wear it anymore because it's got beer stains on it. So I, I think if you can get to a point where you can help people to understand that actually they aren't that different, you know, they might be sitting in a different chair, but it's the same poison in their glass and the same rubbish in their head. And then you can help them to see the similarities. Then you can help them to, to get to grips with those beliefs. So I think it is very encouraging if you can get people to start. My, I, I've honestly never met somebody who drinks heavily who actually enjoys it. They will tell you they enjoy it. They will give you all the kind of reasons why they can't stop under the sun. But underneath that, they are actually fairly desperate for somebody to come along, take them by the hand and say, look, it's it's all right. There is another way. I mean, I, I genuinely, I've met some people and all they wanted was for me to say to them, it's all right. You don't have to drink anymore. I, I mean, like, honestly, don't, <laughs> I don't want to let on at that because, uh, you know, they might want their money back. But um, g- genuinely, there are some people who are so desperate for change on the inside, they're fighting it very much on the outside because they don't know how to do it. And that makes them very, very scared. And the thing is, America is a great social experiment for for many, many reasons. But one of the things that you do really, really well is mandate people to go into recovery. And uh, the people who are forced to go into recovery have, broadly speaking, similar success rates to the people who choose to go into recovery. Because it's honestly, it's not what, it's not actually about how you get there. It's about what you do when you get there. I actually find that very surprising. I would think that the people who are forced to go would have a much lower success rate. Yeah, I I mean, if I was being very, very cynical, I would say that I think this idea that you have to want to change is kind of tied up with the alcohol industry's kind of uh, propaganda about how it is drinkers that are the problem, not the alcohol, you know? It's it's not our lovely product that most people enjoy without having any difficulty. It's those naughty drinkers who have problems and are spoiling it for the rest of, of us. And then they, of course, neatly brush to one side the fact that the vast majority of their profits actually come from people who are drinking at a flat out dangerous level. Yeah. um, With alcohol, I don't know the percentage of people that drink in any countries, but I I know in in the US, a pretty big chunk of adults drink. It would probably be over half, but I don't quote me on that. In the UK, I'd imagine drinking is pretty similar. It's kind of shitty when you stop drinking to some degree. Uh, I think anyone who stops experiences that, like you feel socially isolated, at least some to some degree. It's a social lubricant, many people say, with alcohol. And and I would agree with that. Like, if I wanted to be social, if I had a drink or two, it would definitely help me be more social. How do you prepare people for that that reality without alcohol, being in social situations where other people are going to be drinking, we're not going to be able to, There, I don't see a world where everyone stops drinking and gets on the same page with that. And I don't want that. I, I, I like that people are free to do what they want. And how do you prepare the person who stops drinking for that social isolation, that difference? Like, do they have to change their friend group? Or what do you usually suggest in that? I know. I think. I think that that is a a, a great question and and a, a really good point. That you know, I don't think I actually want to totally destroy the alcohol industry. You know, I don't even think I'd I'd, I'd like to keep it on just to make some hand sanitizer. But I think. For for me, what the world should look like is we should all be able to walk into a restaurant, into a bar, into a party, and there should be just as many non-alcoholic choices as there are alcoholic choices. And actually, the default should be that we don't drink. 
that when somebody says, do you want to go for a drink? What they actually mean is, uh, Duncan, would you like to come around my house for a nice glass of sparkling water, you know, rather than some sort of addictive poison. But as you have probably <laughs> rightly noted, and as your listeners have no doubt spotted, that is not the world that we live in. That is just Duncan's kind of utopia. So how do you prepare for, for the world as we live in? And I think that is so important. You know, I, I put a lot of energy in trying to, to bring about a better world. Um, but I also recognize that people have to live in the rubbish one that we've got at the moment. So I think if you get to grips with your beliefs, properly and you remove these th all of these hang-ups we have about celebration and about socialization and about how alcohol helps you with these things um then actually you don't miss it and you 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 don't mind being around people that are drinking and i think one of the the biggies is about um you know it it removing social anxiety and that is such a an interesting trick that most people will go to a social event and they'll be nervous and they'll have a drink and they'll feel less nervous and then they'll say, oh, it was the drink that made me less nervous. But that's actually utter rubbish because if you just go to a social event and hang around for a bit, you will start to feel less nervous naturally. You know, you, you your, your brain starts to reinterpret the signals. Because when you go into an event, uh, strangers, ah, strange people, ah, I don't know what I'm going to do, ah, it's going to be terrible. And your brain is like going into this kind of fear survival response. Um, but eventually, uh, actually quickly, you know what, like five 10 minutes, it figures out that the world is not about to end. And actually, you know, there's um there's Dave. No, no, not that Dave. There's another Dave, the good Dave. There's good Dave. So you go and have a chat with good Dave and you start to relax into it and you start to enjoy the event. And all of that fear, all of that anxiety, it disappears and it disappears naturally because that is what life is like. You know, nervous at the start of social events, uh, but it disappears. We just mistake alcohol as the thing that removes that social anxiety. And it absolutely isn't. And if you don't believe me, just go to, uh, you know, a kid's party. Actually, that's really terrible advice. Because if you just gate crash a random seven-year-old birthday party, <laughs> you're probably going to get stuck in jail, aren't you? <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? Go to my daughter's seven. So I go to these things all of the time. And start off they're like, they're all nervous. They're hanging around the edge. They're like, ah, oh, clinging on to mummy. They're unsure of it. Five minutes later, they're playing who can tear the radiator off the wall quickest. You know, they're just, they've got into it because, and they don't need alcohol. They don't need drugs. They don't need cigarettes. They don't even need the Haribo. I mean, don't tell them, but they don't. Uh, they just high on life. They're just enjoying themselves. And and it can be like that for you too. You know, you can go to these social events and just, you know, accept, be aware that you feel a little bit nervous and you feel a little bit insecure and then notice as it disappears when you bump into Dave and have a good old chat with him. Because, you know, that is, that is what life is like. You don't need the alcohol. And as soon as you realize that, social events become very different and they become far more enjoyable and you get to, uh, you know, enjoy them for what they are. Now, in terms of whether you need to change your friendship group, or as my my uh, my good friend Leisha said the other day, you need to curate your friendship group. <laughs> That's a beautiful euphemism, isn't it? So for me, I had some people who I used to drink with. They were the classic drinking buddies. The only thing we had in common was alcohol. Honestly, I would hang around with some of them like, you know, Dave, because that's bad, Dave. I'd hang around with him simply because he uh, he drank more than I did and it made me feel better. I don't talk to him anymore because we had nothing in common. So when I got sober, there was like literally nothing for us to talk about. But, um, you know, a lot of my other friends... Honestly, they generally, they some of them even tend to forget that I've stopped drinking. That That's how interested in it they are. They just like, you know, they just carry on as normal. And we go out, we have fun. I drink, um, I drink sparkling water. They drink whatever they want, like. I, I don't care. They, they do what they want. So I think the really, really good news is that if you do it right, social events get better. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. I, and I have a similar experience with, uh, 
I have friends offer me drinks all the time that they just don't, they don't remember that I don't drink and I don't make a big deal out of it. I think it's probably not a great idea to make a big deal out of it because then you kind of end up being the downer of the group because everyone needs to know that you're the sober person. But I feel like I've had some friendships or if I don't even want to call them friendships, but acquaintanceships, acquaintances that have dropped off and they were just drinking friends, people I drank with and we really didn't have anything in common other than the fact that we were drinking. And I think those friendships are just fine to die off and not be there. Your friends in general will be supportive whether you drink or not. And uh, if you're drinking too much, hopefully they support you not drinking for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I've had people who well, I was offered drinks a few weeks ago. And I feel like to me, I know I'm sober at when I go to a party or, or an event, but I feel like what I expect, what I would think would be the case is people would realize I'm not drinking and make a bigger fuss about it and be like, why aren't you drinking or something like that. But for the most part, when I go out to events, nobody really seems to notice. I mean, the only person that might notice is the person who offers me a drink and I decline. I'm like, ah, oh, no, I'm good. And uh, I don't know, it, it, have you experienced pretty similar to that? That That is one of the greatest things uh, about being sober is the lack of interest most people have in it. It's, it's like fantastic because it proves this really, really big point about life that a lot of people just don't get. People do not really care what you do. <laughs> Now, people do not even really notice what you do because they're too obsessed with themselves. And, and to be fair, you know, they've got a lot of worries. They're worried about whether they're paying the mortgage. You know, they're worried about what their idiot boss is trying to do. They're worried about that dodgy rash they've got on their bum. You know, they've got plenty of things to worry about. The last thing they care about is whether you're pouring alcohol down your neck or not. And frankly, if they're offering to buy you a drink, they're probably over the moon that you're not drinking. I mean, have you seen the cost of alcohol these days? It's ridiculous. So, yeah, I mean, I spend a lot of time with people, um, you know, in those those first few months, year. We do a lot of work around how to talk about it and, and how to, uh, you know, make sure you're minimising the difficulties and how to, to bat it away if people are being a little bit passive aggressive. Oh, go on, you can have a drink, it's Christmas, that kind of thing. Um, oh, it's your birthday, you can have just one. Because uh, that does happen. It doesn't happen that much, but it does happen. So I spend a lot of time e equipping people to deal with it. But honestly, my experience is that, you know, I I, I, I was writing a, a bit from, from my latest book and um, I, I literally spent an entire cup of coffee thinking about it. And I could not think of a single occasion when somebody was was genuinely out and out hateful about it, who was just like really awful about it. I mean, my mates take the mick, you know, but that's like casual, good natured, laugh a minute stuff. You know, it's the, they, 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 they'll take the mick out of me for not drinking in the same way they'll casually inf inform me that they're sleeping with my wife or something like that. You know, so it's it's not not a big thing, kind of, kind of. But uh, what I would say is that if anybody you know, if anybody is genuinely mean or nasty or hateful, ain't no friend of yours. Curate them. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you, you've written three books now. Uh, I really like the title of your most recent one, but I can't recall it. I know it had the word quit in it. Can you say the title of it? Uh, Real Men Quit. Real Men Quit. I hope you mean that one. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, we have a society that stigmatizes the word quit as negative, pretty much always negative. And uh, not just with alcohol, but I, I tend to believe quitting is actually a very useful skill in general. Like if you only have so much time in your day, and if you want to achieve certain things that you want to achieve, you need to figure out what things you need to quit. And for me, one of those things was alcohol but it's been many other things. Like I've quit jobs that didn't serve me well. I've, I've walked away from many 
situations or or hobbies that I just didn't that didn't suit my long term goals. Can you talk about that a little bit? What do you think about the societal view of quitting in general, and uh, did that impact your choice of the title? Yeah, I'm, I'm so. <sighs> At some point, the idea of real men quit formed itself in my head and people seemed to quite like it. So that's why I I went for it. I think it's got that kind of slightly um, aggressive, controversial ring to it. And, and, and that quit is quite a hard word. But there's something very interesting about the word quit, because when we're when we're talking about it in terms of alcohol and things like that, we tend to, you know, ah, oh, quit. That is a bad thing. But actually, often when we use it in terms of jobs, it's a good thing. You know, like if you quit the job you hate, that is an amazing thing. That is a really positive step. So I, th- I, I don't know whether my, my attempts to reclaim the word quit are really going to kind of do much, but um, I, I think you are absolutely right. And incidentally, I'm, I might write a book uh, on the list of books that I want to write is one called Quitters Win. And it is exactly about that point that, you know, we as a society think that adding more stuff is generally the solution to most things, you know. If you've got an illness, add some medication. You know, if you're bored and dissatisfied with life, add more entertainment. You know, feeling a bit lonely and and unhappy, buy a new car. You know, it's like, oh, it's add things, add things, add things, more, 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 more. And in actual fact, you know, freeing yourself from that continual cycle of addition with with a nice little bit of subtraction and quitting some stuff, uh, you know, it can do wonders for you. And... I think underneath that, there's this idea that get, it, it does does get some airtime, but nowhere near enough. Is that every time you say yes to something, you're actually saying no to an awful lot of things, because by doing what you're doing, you are unable to do a lot of things. You know, in business, it's called an opportunity cost, and I think people need to understand the opportunity cost of their behaviour. So uh, if you decide to um, join the fundraising committee for your daughter's school, uh, you know, you're saying yes to that. But what is it that you're saying no to? Are you saying no to spending quality time with your daughter, with your wife, with your family, because you're always at the PTA meetings? You know, Um, are you saying no to uh, reading those books you want to read? Are you uh, saying no to falling off your inline skates? You know, you, you, you are saying no to something. So, so, um, you know, be a bit more deliberate and um, yeah, quitters win. Yeah. I mean, you touch on, very important things there. I think you don't become successful or you're not going to, it's going to be very difficult to be successful in anything. If you're trying to, if you're saying yes to everything else going on around you, you only have so much time in your day. And yeah, I, I just, I think that's very valuable. Um, you mentioned inline skating. How do you, uh, is that something you started before you stopped drinking or after? Oh, so um, we have an ice rink in Oxford, and when I was a when I was a, a youngster, I used to spend a lot of my time skating around it. So um, I I also had quads when I was a kid. So I, like I was pretty good at skating um, when I when I was younger. Uh, I just um, sort of paused for a little bit, and then I started up. Uh, I don't know, 18 months ago. So yeah, at some point during my sobriety, uh, it is not a midlife crisis. It's absolutely not a midlife crisis. Um, but, uh, and now my daughter does it. So we, we go on a Friday night, we go to the roller disco and it's, it's quite good because I get to skate faster than young children. And that makes me feel very good. <laughs> what is that? One of your other hobbies is Morris dancing. Can you elaborate on what that is? Yeah, so Morris dancing is a very weird English thing. It's a kind of folk dance. Actually, there there are Morris dancing uh, groups in in America. We have managed to export it, but um, it's the we 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 wear white clothes. We have lots of ribbons, funny hat with flowers on it, bells, and we wave hankies and we dance to sort of traditional folk music. Um, and 
in general, it tends to happen around alcohol. So it often happens in pubs. Uh, we often dance at beer festivals. Uh, we will often be found uh, to be found near the beer tent at um, some kind of f- fete or school fair or something like that. And when I started, which sort of nearly 20 years ago now, um, yeah, absolutely. Part of the attraction was, was the drinking. Um, because we will often go off, you know, in the morning and, oh, you can have a pint at 10 o'clock in the morning and nobody really like thinks too much of it because that's what Morris dancers do. And, um, I hope none of them are listening because quite a few of them are actually called Dave. Um, but the thing was when I stopped drinking, it was like, well, Am I going to continue dancing? And for me, it was it was such an important lesson because I kind of went along to a couple of things very early in my sobriety, a little bit nervous. How am I going to handle this? But I just relaxed into it. And as soon as we, uh, you know, we got chatting, we got dancing, I was enjoying myself I, and I wasn't missing the beer. And it kind of quickly became obvious to me that what is important about that as an activity, you know, it's, it's the sense of tradition, the heritage, you know, I, I'm, I'm very grounded in the place that I live and I want to keep the traditions that we have in our, in, in our, uh, in, in our community alive. You know, that's important to me. Um, and I actually quite like dancing. I, I think there's a massive therapeutic aspect to dancing, you know, not simply the kind of like cardiovascular body weight fitness kind of aspect of it. I think there's this big piece about embodiment and, and becoming more aware of, of how you sense and feel things in your body. I think that's a massive therapeutic piece. Um, but I actually all, I like all of the guys that I dance with as well. They're, they're a great bunch, very, very wide range of people, lots of different experiences. You know, I even like Dave. Uh, He's a great guy. Um, So there was all of these things that I love about Morris dancing, you know, the tradition, the community, the, the, the people, the actual activity itself. And for so long, I thought it was all about the beer when the beer had nothing to do with it. And it's, I'm, I'm endeavouring to to create a bit of groundswell in in the group, and there, there are a few more coming over to my side. They're like drinking a bit less, or they they've stopped drinking, and uh, there's more and more of them figuring out. Actually, you know what? It's not about the alcohol. It was never about the alcohol, and that is true of so much that you do in life. Yeah, with with that being kind of a a thing that has a lot of alcohol around it. For me personally, when I stopped drinking, it was 2020. Everything was going into lockdown. There weren't many social activities to go and partake in. Do you recommend people avoid certain activities for a certain amount of time after they stop drinking? Or or how do you recommend people approach social situations in which there will be alcohol in a way that doesn't disrupt their goals of avoiding alcohol. Yeah, I mean, I think it's this very interesting kind of like definition of the word change that um, part of me says, well, you don't need to change your life simply because you've stopped drinking. You know, if you are a Morris dancer, go Morris dancing. And if you enjoy it, keep doing it. But if you don't enjoy it anymore, then change it do something else. Um, so I would encourage people to to just go out and live their lives as they have lived them, just alcohol-free, and kind of see what happens. And most of the people, and I, you know, I have interviewed you know, a lot of people who've got sober, stayed sober, become very successful. And the, a lot of the time when they, they talk about it, they talk about it happening in a very kind of natural way that you don't really need to be that conscious of it. You just kind of figure out after a while that this is the Dave I want to keep talking to. And this is the Dave I want to ignore. And you, you you work out, you work out which Dave you want to spend time with and and you do it without even really being that consciously aware of it. I mean, there are some things I, I, I think people 
tend to need to be a bit more conscious aware, consciously aware of, whether that's around emotions or other kind of physical health issues like diet and exercise. That's often quite a good one. And then those goals, you know, what do you want to do with your newfound energy f- freedom and, and self-respect? You know, um, those are things that it is often worth being kind of conscious with. But, you know, in terms of relationships, they will just tend to kind of level out. At least that has been the experience of a lot of the people that I've worked with and and talked with. Okay. What have you experienced with all the people you've interviewed that have been sober? Do they typically do they typically avoid those social occasions with alcohol for a little bit, or do they just go right into it and and just say no? In general, they just go about living their life. Some of them will talk about being very much more prescriptive about it. So um, they will be quite, they will be more aware of it. So if they if they start to feel uncomfortable, some of them will leave a bit will leave quite quickly um, and they'll just say, well, it's not worth risking my sobriety on this event. It's making me feel uncomfortable, so I'm just leaving. And I would absolutely encourage and support people to have the strength to do that. You know, if something makes you feel uncomfortable, if you find it um, is triggering you. But again, there are a lot of different ways of getting sober. And what you can almost see with people is... The things that they struggle with, if they just tell you the things that they struggle with, you can usually tell them what method they've used to get sober because there tends to be strengths and weaknesses to all of the methods. And uh, there tends to be commonalities that these kind of people tend to struggle with this issue. These kind of people tend to struggle with this issue. Um, And uh, yeah, so so I've, I've met plenty of people who have been like, wanting to stress that it really hasn't changed anything about what they do it might it it, so it it doesn't change the start of the evening I guess that's the best way of doing I was talking to somebody earlier today and she was saying um she went to this big black tie gala event and uh she went as normal uh enjoyed it had um you know a nice elderflower and sparkling water had a couple of those um had the dinner listened to the after dinner speaker the entertainment started um it and then people started to get a little bit drunk so she just left and um walked home uh you know feeling kind of safe because she was sober got on the train got the train back actually got home early enough that she thought she had time to watch another episode of the box set that her and her husband are on so she didn't change anything really about the evening in terms of how it started and how it went but it did end very differently so i think i would encourage people to get those beliefs about socializing right and then go out and socialize and just enjoy it and clearly, if you do, you know, if, if it is triggering you and you're not, yeah, and you're feeling worried about it, just, just come home. Yeah, I, for me, it's not necessarily triggering to be around drunk people, but I don't enjoy it as much <laughs> as I did when I was drinking. I, I'll be around friends that are drinking and I don't have a problem with that, but sometimes I'll find myself interacting with somebody who's clearly had more than they should have had. and. I, I look back to when I was drinking, I'm like, I would probably sit here having a conversation with this person five years ago, but right now there's no interest on my part because, I mean, if you're a sober person around a bunch of drunk people, you can probably carry a conversation a lot more fluidly uh, and you can go deeper in your conversation. And those, some people that are drunk are some people that are drinking can have great conversations, but once they've had too many, there's this that, that glassed over look in their eyes and they're not really comprehending everything that's being said. And those conversations will start boring me a little bit. Yeah. Do you know what? I know exactly what you mean, because there's a particular group of people that I, I spend time with. I don't spend a lot of time with them, but um, we, we go out every now and again and 
when I stopped drinking, I, I learned that there was this kind of tapestry within the group that, you know, some of them drink quite heavily and get quite messy um, relatively early on. Um, and some of them don't drink that much at all. They'll make that one pint last for hours and hours and hours and they'll make it look like they're drinking, but they're never really drinking. And the thing is, I never noticed that when I was drinking because I was probably like the messy guys and I was talking to them and we were talking complete nonsense and neither of us remembered it in the morning. So no harm, no foul, I guess. But it, it, it was very interesting to me to sort of see the massive variety within this, within this group. I thought everybody was just there drinking as much as me, having, you know, the same kind of good old time that I thought I was having. Not that I could remember it the next day. Um, and uh, actually, you know, there was there was this this great variety to it. And I, what I think is best about it is you you get the choice. You know, when you're a drinker, you know, you have to drink until the drink runs out. You have to party until you pass out. You don't really have any choice. You start at the start of the evening, and you have to be there until you can no longer stand up. Whereas, of course, when you're not drinking, you actually get the choice. You know, you can you can leave after the first drink if you want to, if you're not really enjoying it. You can wait until that point that's usually about seven minutes past 11 in my experience. That Just that moment when the party goes and it just kind of like drops over the other side and everybody stops being kind of like funny, outgoing, gregarious, had a couple of drinks then and starts being melancholic, drunken idiot then. Um, or... You know, if the party is genuinely fun, you can stay to the bitter end and, um, you know, you still won't feel that bad in the morning. Yeah, I had a, a friend's wedding that I stayed until the very end recently. It was the best wedding I've ever gone to. And uh, his name was Dave. <laughs> and uh, it was a great party and I really enjoyed it. I think one one thing you touched on with the not remembering aspect, I think it's something that people who are not drinking should keep in mind. I think the next day, I mean, while you might feel insecure about not having a drink in front of you and not, you know, enjoying, or I don't want to use the word enjoying, but not partaking in everything that everyone else is doing, the next day, no one's going to remember that you weren't drinking. No one's going to, that's not going to be on anyone's mind of like, Oh, Duncan didn't drink. Artie didn't drink. Like no one's really going to focus on that at all. So I think it's a a worthwhile thing to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I just, you know, I I, I often come back to this idea of mortgaging stuff. You know, like if you if you want to buy a house, you borrow a hundred thousand pounds off the bank, and you pay them back two hundred and fifty thousand pounds. And that works when you're buying a house because the values of houses go up. But when you're talking about that kind of anxiety and you've got a bit of anxiety at the start of the evening and you buy some uh, you, something to remove that anxiety, but what you've got to realize is that you have to pay that anxiety back and you do pay two and a half times more anxiety back. So you're taking that small amount of anxiety at the start of the evening and you're shipping it out to, to the next morning when you will feel two and a half times more anxious. And that's uh, if you're lucky. You know, and I can I can bore you to death with the the way that works in terms of brain chemistry and stuff like that. But you know, you get that tiny spike of um, the brain chemical um, that makes you feel less anxious the night before, and you pay for it by a massive drop in it the next day. Yeah, and over time it gets worse as well. Like when I was 18, 20 years old, I was drinking already, but I had the ability to go out and go to a party and interact with people without any alcohol. And over time, you kind of, you depend on it more. And then it's, it, it's a more of a learning curve to get away from that and, and get used to interacting without the alcohol involved in the situation. Like I quit when I was I have 34, 35 years old. That's, you know, nearly 20 years of drinking. That's a big habit to break away from. So I think that's important. Have you 
had anyone that you worked with that had experience with using psychedelics to overcome alcohol, alcoholism, like uh, there's ketamine being used, uh, psilocybin mushrooms, acid, I would imagine some people can do that. Um, what's your take on that? Uh, so I I interviewed somebody um, recently who, who is very keen on uh, developing that as a path to recovery. Uh, I haven't met anybody that's actually done it. I, I mean, if there are any listeners listening who have, like, really seriously get in touch, we should chat. Um, it's Baskaran with an H. If you can spell Baskaran Brown, I'm quite easy to find. You just got to get the H in the right place. Because, like, honestly, who spells stuff B-H-A? It's weird. Anyway, um, so I haven't had any direct experience with people. That said, you know, I've, I've, I've done my research. I, I, I know about the amazing potential therapeutically of substances like MDMA and uh, psilocybin, LSD, all of those kind of things. And I also know my history, so I know how they have been, you know, like terribly maligned and how some quite promising scientific research was totally like hacked off um, at the head by by Richard Nixon. And I mean, to be honest with you, there were people um, like Tim Leary who were just blinking idiots and not doing anybody any favors really but um yeah i think that there's there is a huge amount of unprocessed trauma in the world you could make an argument to say it is a bigger problem than climate change and i think the potential for really nicely well guided therapeutic sessions um of limited duration with uh, psychoactive chemicals. I think that has enormous potential. I mean, I wouldn't just rush out and try it. <laughs> you know, there there is clearly a danger in that. Uh, I mean, I have some experience uh, of of non therapeutic use of MDMA and um, uh, psilocybin from back in the day. Uh, and well, I mean, it. You know, it. I've I've done quite a few drugs and ecstasy was was one of the most pleasant of them all in as far as it, it did not make me feel bloody awful the next day. Pretty much everything else I've ever taken has done. Um, and it is quite, you know, in terms of its uh, psychoactive effect, making you kind of love everybody. That's not, not bad. It kind of hints a little bit at what you were saying about marijuana earlier. You know, I'm not an advocate for California sobriety. I don't, I don't take marijuana myself. Um, but you know, if, if, if you had to choose between that and alcohol, I would recommend you take marijuana every single time. Um, so I, I think there's enormous potential there. And I, I really, I really hope that the, very committed and passionate scientists who are trying to get the, the the studies done are given the opportunity to to really delve into that because I think it, it's potentially huge. But what what I think is most important about it is we have to see it as um, you know an, another option in a field of options. Um, I, the way I think of the recovery community at the moment is it is a little bit like martial arts before MMA came along. You know, everybody will tell you that their fighting style is the strongest, but nobody really knows because nobody's actually had a fight. Um, and, you know, what everybody's got their own kind of like passionate technique for helping people to recover. And that's great. You know, I love passion. I love people who really believe in what they do. I think that's so important, but we need a much more integrated approach. We need to start realizing that, you know, some people, they are just capoeira, you know, it looks good, but it doesn't actually work. Um, what we really need to do is we really need to be delving into Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You know, we need to, we need to, to take what we can from everybody. We should learn how to punch from the boxers. We should learn how to kick from the karate guys. We should learn how to grapple from the uh, judokus. You know, we need to, we need to look at the whole spectrum of recovery and target what we are offering to individuals based on what will work best for them rather than, you know, what works best for us as therapists and coaches. Yeah, I, I have 
experience with psychedelics and MDMA, both situations like MDMA, it was all recreational. Uh, everything else I've done recreationally, but I've, I've done mushrooms in a more therapeutic settings and I think it has some real potential, but it's also not something that should be taken lightly. MDMA, I'm actually surprised that you didn't suffer negative effects from that. Cause I, I feel like that was one of the harder recoveries after a night of taking MDMA, like it affects you for like a month, but I'm not. I would not recommend MDMA for anyone at this point because you don't know what's in it anymore. Um, fentanyl is all over and you just don't want to get that crap in you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I see, I, I, I didn't do a huge amount. B, it was a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was back when um, ecstasy was actually ecstasy rather than just whatever they found on the floor of the place they were making it these days. Yeah. I mean, that is ultimately the problem with the, the illegal supply. And one of the reasons why um, mushrooms are, are, are probably uh, a, a lot better because it's quite hard to, to tamper with them, isn't it? Because they are a mushroom and they look a lot like mushrooms. And if they don't look like mushrooms, you're not being sold what you're uh, supposed to be sold. And the other thing is, a lot of the psychedelics, I, I, um, they they do get a bit of a get out of jail free card because they actually act on your brain quite differently to the way most drugs do. I mean, that said, technically opioids act on your brain differently to the way stimulants and alcohol act on your brain. But um, the the thing with psychedelics is if you if you take them regularly, they very quickly lose any effect. Um, you you become not. It's it's not the same with tolerance with alcohol, where by the effect that you get diminishes, therefore you take more of it. It's like to the point that you could eat the stuff all bloody day, and it would have very it would have no effect on you. So uh, that's why you don't tend to meet anybody that's ever got addicted to to, to mushrooms. Um, that I. I I, I am not an expert in neurologist uh, neurology, but it is my understanding that because of the way it works on your brain, it is almost impossible to get addicted to. Yeah, I can believe that. I I know just from my personal experience that like taking mushrooms is not something I would. It's just not something I do lightly. Like it's even if I had around the clock access to them it would be like once a year, maybe twice a year. And it would be a very controlled thing where I'm, I'm, you have to set the right atmosphere. You have to be in the right mindset to do stuff like that because yeah, like things, you can have a bad trip. Like it's very possible to have that. And you, you want to set yourself up for success when you're going to partake in anything like that. You see, I think that's really interesting because most people will give psychedelics the amount of respect that they kind of deserve. And, you know, most people will say, well, I'm not going to mess with it because, you know, I might have a bad trip. Yet they'll happily go out and pour alcohol down their, 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 their throats, despite the fact that it kills people, you know, and, and not like in some long term cirrhosis of the liver kind of thing. Like it kills young people all of the time because they, they freeze to death because they, they are too drunk to get home. They fall off stuff. They fall into rivers. You know, that Jeff Buckley, um, the, the guy that made Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah song famous, you know, he drowned because he was, trying to swim across the Mississippi after drinking a bottle of Jack Daniels, you know, like people don't give alcohol the respect it deserves because that shit will kill you. Yeah. And, and not just, I mean, like there's so many different things that you can do on alcohol, like domestic violence is increased with alcohol. Drunk driving kills people all the time. Uh, like you said, I mean, people freeze to death um, in certain areas, like where it's really cold and they just get stuck outside. There's so many different ways that alcohol can kill you in that sense. And then it's, it also is, I believe, one of the only, if not the only substance that you can actually die from withdrawal from. Is that correct? Or do you know? Ooh, um, I mean, certainly some people do die from uh, withdrawal from alcohol. It is, it is very rare. 
and it's something that comes up every now and again. Uh, so in terms of withdrawal effects, I believe it is only about 4% of people that, that drink alcohol get any kind of um, noticeable withdrawal effects, which would be things like tremors or, or seizures or heart issues or things like that, which is the kind of stuff that can kill you. Uh, that said, you know, I, I am not a proper doctor. I am not a proper anything, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, you know, I have what the pros would call lived experience and I do read a lot, but, um, you know, if you are in any way concerned, you should clearly seek the advice of a medical physician type person. And, uh, you know, if you are, if, if you're really worried, call an ambulance. Yeah. Um, but leaving all of that aside, yeah, I, I mean, the withdrawal from alcohol, like it, it, it is unpleasant when it gets bad. The things that tend to make it bad are, um, previous problems with drawing from alcohol. So if you, if you do the the vacillating thing from drinking very heavily, withdrawing, uh, stopping, drinking very heavily, stopping, if you do that a lot, you will tend to get quite nasty complications. If you have underlying health issues, that doesn't help. If you've previously been addicted to benzodiazepine or you've had long-term benzodiazepine abuse, um, then that can cause a lot of problems as well. So Yes, it does cause problems, but you know, my like kind of don't have nightmares kid piece is that those problems are pretty rare and they tend to be the people that are drinking very, very heavily and have some other issues as well. Yeah, you touch on benzos and benzos and alcohol are a horrible uh, combination too. I, I believe that you can, like your heart can stop if you mix those two. And I know people do it, but and it's not like you're guaranteed to have some issue like that, but it's very possible. And I I know one person who had seizures after stopping alcohol. And the sad thing to me is that I think it kind of ended up being a reason not to stop, which I don't think that should be used to justify it. It just means that you need to approach it the right way. But um, Duncan, I've, I've very much enjoyed this conversation today. Before we wrap up, um, will you give listeners a way to reach you and, and follow you on different social medias or contact you if they'd like to work with you and then anything else you'd like to share? Yeah. So uh, like I said earlier, you know, I am ludicrously easy to find online so long as you can spell Baskaran. So my surname uh, is from South India. Uh, that's where my wife is from. And when we got married, she didn't want to be Mrs. Brown. So we decided to be the Baskaran Browns. And I'm pretty confident we are the only Baskaran Browns. So my uh, my website is baskaranbrown.com. That is B. H A S K A R A N and Brown, you can probably spell. Um, I do a lot of stuff on LinkedIn around alcohol and business. I do a lot of stuff on Facebook and Instagram just around alcohol, sobriety, uh, getting clean, those kind of things. So if any of your listeners want to connect with me, uh, just follow me, like me, connect with me, uh, chase me, wh whatever the appropriate verb for whichever social we're talking about um, is, you, you know, hook up with me and send me a message and then I will happily send you a PDF or a Kindle version or an audiobook version of my last book, which is called Get Over Indulgence, which is um, a little bit about alcohol and a little bit about food as well and some comparisons and, and some jokes. Actually, quite a lot of jokes. Hassan Duncan, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, it's, been, it's been a pleasure. It's been very, very interesting. I'll have to get you onto my podcast. Yeah, I'd love it. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If our conversations resonate with you, consider leaving a five-star rating on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your streaming platform of choice. Your ratings help us grow and reach more listeners. Don't hesitate to spread the word about our podcast. It's one of the best ways you can support us. I'm always eager to hear from you. So find me on Twitter at TMConvos or follow us on Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless for a peek behind the scenes and more thoughtful content. And if you're looking for additional ways to support the show, visit FractalZoo.net 
where you can find exclusive t-shirts and apparel. Each purchase contributes directly to the podcast and allows us to keep bringing you content that matters. Thank you once again for lending us your ears. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless. Thank you.